Next, welcome Ellen Stofan, the director of the National Air and Space Museum, with The Atlantic's Ross Anderson. <clears throat> All right, Dr. Stofan, it's hard to follow the panda. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Stofan, you, uh, last time that we did this, you were chief scientist of NASA, um, and which is to say that you sort of bore the burden of kind of towing the company line for NASA. So now that we have you <laughs> back in a different job, um, tell us how, from your outside perspective now, how are things going at NASA Science? You know, when you look at NASA science, I mean, it's an amazing array of what they're accomplishing, from understanding this planet, to exploring the solar system, to understanding the sun, to reaching out into the universe. And it's, an, it's a really healthy program. It has been a healthy program, and I hope it continues that way. Um, it wasn't a burden uh, uh, to represent because we were, you know, we were doing exciting things at NASA, and I think they continue to accomplish great things. Has there been any sort of shift in priorities uh, with the change of administrations that you've noticed? No, I really haven't, and it's certainly something that um, there was a lot of concern about, especially in the realm of Earth science. But mm -hmm. I've been really pleased to see that NASA continues to have a really healthy program of observing this planet. And that's really critical, because obviously with climate change, huge concerns over can we understand what's happening on the planet right now where we see these really clear signs um, that the climate is changing. This isn't, you know, it is a theory, but it is happening. And I think we've all seen that, especially from these strong, wet hurricanes that we've experienced in the last two years. But NASA continues to use its tools in space to really understand this planet and help us understand how it's going to change more in the future. Hmm. Um, tell me what interested you about this new job. Y you know, um, I will say that being um, director of the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian is a huge honor and a privilege. And for some who might not have, have read this before, I actually interned at the museum after my freshman year in college. I was a geology major at the College of William and Mary, and I spent a summer working upstairs at the museum. They have a group called the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies, where we have a group of scientists who study this planet. And I will say at that point, I never dreamed I would ever come back as, as director. Mm. But when I knew that mm. the previous, when I heard that the previous director was retiring, I thought, you know, what better platform is there in the world than the world's most visited museum to really inspire that next generation of explorers and innovators? You know, we get over 8 million visitors a year. We have amazing artifacts that really tell the story of this human struggle against gravity. Hmm. Um. <laughs> <laughs> gravity. Didn't think you would mention that. No. Uh, what do you think? I mean, you mentioned that it's the most visited museum. What do you think is so compelling about space for people? You know, I think, again, it goes back to the struggle of, of innovation, of exploration. And from the Wright brothers in 1903, getting, getting us off the ground for the first time, all the way in, in actually one human lifetime, we say from, the, from Kitty Hawk to the Sea of Tranquility. Mm. You know, my museum tells that story. And it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story of American achievement, American ingenuity, uh, it's inspiring, it's the better angels of our nature, this desire to explore, um, to get off the ground, to go up in space, across the ocean. Uh, it, it's a great story. Um, I am a frequent visitor to both of your museums, the hangar out by Dulles with the shuttle and the Blackbird and the Enola Gay and all the things. And then also, I, whenever I'm on the mall, I'll, I'll duck into the museum on the mall and I, I feel comfortable saying this since I know you're mid-renovation, but it started to look a bit shabby, um, a bit outdated. So tell me, what's in store for this renovation? Well, you know, they were actually looking at the building after the earthquake that affected Washington over about over 10 years ago, and they were sort of examining the building downtown to see if it had been damaged in the earthquake. And what they discovered was that all the stone panels on the outside of the building were warped and cracked, and they'd been letting water into the structure of the museum for decades. And that's, it, it had nothing to do with the earthquake. It has a lot to do with the fact they made the panels much thinner than they were supposed to have, and they didn't bracket them properly. So just the, the building is just in really poor shape. And so we realized we basically have to take all that stone off the outside of the building um, and almost rebuild the structure around the museum. 
On the other hand, that gives us the opportunity to say, it's time to renew the interior of the museum. What yeah. can we do to tell stories that we haven't been able to tell, bring new artifacts into the museum, and really refresh um, the content so that we can inspire this next generation of explorers? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> in addition to this renovation, uh, when you think about the exhibits that you're gonna bring in for the next, um, however long you end up being there, uh, will there be a change in emphasis as to what sort of previous exhibits have addressed? Certainly for anybody who comes to the museum seven years from now when we, when we finish the renovation, they're gonna see some very familiar things. The Wright Flyer, the Spirit of St. Louis, uh, the Apollo uh, Command Module that will come back after a tour that it's on. So their old favorites will be there. Certainly those stories will be there, but we'd also like to tell new stories. Uh, for example, a lot of the stories go on the people behind the artifacts. You know, when museums used to put exhibits together, it was always about, here's an artifact, here's an artifact, here's, you know, here's a plane, here's, here's a spacecraft. Now we really want to tell, who were the people who invented these things? Who were the people who designed them? Who are the people that worked on them and used them? Because I think it's the story behind the artifacts that is really what captures people's imaginations. <coughs> the other thing is, obviously, since the museum opened in 1976, a fair amount of things have happened in both aviation and space exploration. And sure. we want to tell those stories from the increasing role of the private sector in space exploration, to what are the latest innovations in aircraft that we see, like supersonics and hypersonics. Hmm. Um, you're coming up on one of the most iconic anniversaries in the history of space exploration, 50 years uh, from the moon landing next August, July, somewhere around there. Um, <clears throat> first of all, what do you have planned? And second of all, have you had any fun digging in the archives? Well, you know, it, it's hard, especially for people of my age, to, to realize it really has been 50 years since, since we landed on the moon. That'll be, of course, July 20th of next summer. But what we're really going to do is have an entire year of celebrating the Apollo missions writ large, uh, with, of course, the celebration culminating next July. Uh, we're really kicking it off in December um, celebrating Apollo 8, which to me is an incredible, meaningful mission um, from the fact that it's, it's when they came around the backside of the moon and got that very iconic image of the Earth rising over the moon's surface, the Earth rise image that uh, a lot of people feel actually uh, inspired the environmental movement on the sure. Earth. So we're going to start the celebration around that. We're going to go through the year really talking about the legacy of Apollo. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, they focus on the the men who actually landed on the moon, but over 400,000 Americans working across the country enabled that incredible feat of going in eight years from President Kennedy setting a directive to us actually landing on the moon. And so it did take a nation to make it happen. And so we're gonna be talking about those stories but we're also gonna look forward. I really don't want this to turn into a, oh, our best days are behind us. Our best days are in front of us. We're gonna go back to the moon. We're gonna go send humans to Mars. That's gonna happen during our lifetime. And we wanna inspire the next generation. I want a young girl who came into my museum to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo. I want her to be the first person to walk on Mars. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Is there anything that hasn't been on display that's like backstage from, from the moon stuff that's really, really fascinating? Well, I have to tell you, you know, obviously as the new director, I get to poke around in things. We actually yeah. have over 5,500 pieces of art and we have amazing art, a lot of it from the Apollo era that I've gotten to go back in the art room and look at our absolutely incredible art collection. But the thing that's really affected me the most is, um, some of you might know, a couple years ago, the museum actually held a Kickstarter campaign to help uh, uh, restore Neil Armstrong's uh, spacesuit that he wore when he walked on the moon. And uh, so we've been in the process, a lot of the inside of the suit was, was actually deteriorating, so we had to stabilize it, repair it, and get it ready for display. It will go back on display uh, next summer, uh, before July 20th, um, and it'll be the first time that the whole suit with the helmet will actually um, be on display. But what was amazing was I got to go into the conservation lab where our conservators were working on the suit um, and stand right next to it. And what I loved the most about it was from the knees down, the suit is grimy. 
I mean, <clears throat> it's just <clears throat> looks like you just went outside and like we're walking around. It's moon dust. Mm -hmm. The moon dust is so fine <clears throat> that it's actually embedded in the fabric of the suit. So you're looking at the suit that was worn by a human who walked on another world and it's got that world like stuck all over it. And, and yeah. it, it's just, it, honestly, it just sent chills down my spine. It was, yeah. it, it's incredibly, and again, then you think of what went behind that. How did that happen? It took these 400,000 Americans coming together as a team, as a nation, yeah. to accomplish this. And that suit <laughs> represents that. So everybody's gonna get to see it, including, don't worry, we're not cleaning it. It's still gonna yeah. have moons stuck all over it when you all get to see it next summer. Were you tempted to like put it on or take a selfie with it or anything like that? <laughs> or I behaved myself. No, you know, you, you just, you, when I got this job, my kids who are grown up, um, they're like, can we sit in the space shuttle? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was recently uh, at the museum in the mall to watch one of the um, screenings you guys did for the, uh, I guess is it 50th anniversary of the 2001 mm -hmm. Space Odyssey. <clears throat> and you actually had, for everyone, anyone who's seen this movie, the, that like creepy white room at the very end, you had it on the premises, which I thought was so cool. And I wondered, um, you know, space exploration has given <clears throat> rise to this really rich culture uh, in popular culture and high culture and low culture. And is the museum going to bring more of that into play? We are, and that was a really fun exhibit that we did. The Barmicide mm. Feast is what that creepy white room is, is called, and it really was amazing to go stand inside of it. I hope some of you got to go see it um, while we had it on display. But I will say we've always had this role as a culture museum. Uh, anyone who's been to our Boeing Milestones of Flight gallery, the main gallery, when you, when you come right in the door where we have things like Chuck Yeager's Bell X-1 that broke the speed of sound, we also have in there the Starship Enterprise. It's actually the original model that they used for the TV show. So all through the museum, we try to bring in the fact that there's actually this interplay between yeah. culture and the artifacts. And for some people, that helps, that, that's their connection. You know, they're more of a mm -hmm. culture person, and so that helps them sort of interpret the collection and understand it. On the other hand, I believe there's this strong, it doesn't just go one way. It's not just that exploration inspires culture, culture inspires exploration. Mm -hmm. And that's something we hope to continue exploring in the museum. For example, there's, some of you might have heard the last couple of years there's been a tricorder challenge where, you know, obviously that's something from, from Star Trek, yeah. uh, a medical device, but there was a challenge to say, can we actually invent that? So I also <laughs> feel like science fiction inspires exploration. Um, as you're increasingly seeing space exploration sort of move into the private sector or certain aspects of it, will your job in sort of collecting artifacts get harder? I think it'll just get more interesting and multifaceted because obviously for years, NASA has been the main source of our artifacts because they've done most of the, the creation of space artifacts. Uh, on the other hand, we've worked for a long time with both private aviators and the aviation industry to collect uh, aviation artifacts from private companies. What I'm hoping is over the next couple years as I'm reaching out and talking to a lot of uh, commercial companies is to make sure they understand the value of, of what they're doing. You, you know, we're on the verge of actually seeing space tourism become a reality. We're on the verge of seeing private companies actually go to the moon. What they're doing is historic, and I don't want them to be saying, oh, this is our test article, you know, we're going to throw it away or we're going to re repurpose it, because for historians, what, this, this is the story, you know, that mm. 50 years from now, 100 years from now, I want to be able to tell that story, and I need the artifacts to do that. So I'm going to be twisting a lot of arms in the next couple of years to get those artifacts, which are, mm. which are fun and show this innovation mm. and this teamwork and all these themes that, again, to me, help inspire the next generation. Is there a, a dream artifact that the museum has never been able to get that you'd love to have? Maybe something on another planet or? A Mars rock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, the Natural History Museum has meteorites from Mars, so they already kind of have a Mars rock. Yeah. Um, it, you know, obviously our spacecraft, once they go out, whether it's the Hubble Space Telescope, which we do have a test model of, or the Curiosity rover, which is on Mars, which we also have the test rover in our museum. You know, we're able to tell those stories with the test 
test articles, we actually have a camera that was brought back uh, that was from one of the surveyor, one of the early um, uncrewed moon missions. Um, later, one of the Apollo missions, they actually took the camera off the surveyor that had been sitting on the moon, and that is in our museum. So that's always my goal, is to think to the yeah. future, and I want those Mars astronauts to bring back an instrument from the Viking landers that landed on Mars in 1976, and I want that in the museum. Yeah. Dr. Stofan, thank you for being with us. Thank Great. you. <clears throat>